everybody to welcome everyone to the South Orange Library Fall Lecture Series, Special Conversations with Special People. For those of you who are a little surprised not to see Phyllis Kalb, um, I'm the new moderator for the series, Laura Sims, and I'm really happy to be following in Phyllis's wonderful footsteps of this program that she ran for over 30 years. Um, so thank you so much for, for joining us today. Thanks, Hi, thank Phyllis. You. She's here. Um, today, I'm so pleased to have Marcel Lease with us. And she is our own South Orange Library staff member, Jenna Lease's mother. And that is just one of her many accomplishments and honors. <laughs> Um, Marcel is a Chief Master Sergeant in the U.S. Air Force and New York National Guard who retired after 24 years of service. In addition to her military tours, she participated in numerous humanitarian relief efforts, including helping those impacted by Hurricane Sandy in 2012. She received a number of commendations and medals during her military service, and after retiring, began to work with the Joseph P. Dwyer Veterans Peer Support Project, which helps veterans transition from military to civilian life by connecting them with valuable wellness resources. Marcel is now the Director of Veteran Services at the Association for Mental Health and Wellness, where she focuses on emergency shelter and permanent housing for veterans. She has an MS in Human Services Leadership and is an adjunct professor at St. Joseph's College in their Human Services undergraduate program. Today, she'll be discussing military and veteran cultural awareness, an important topic to learn about from such an expert. So thank you so much, Marcel, for joining us today. Thank you very much, Laura. I really do appreciate the opportunity to come and speak um, to your community here in South Orange. Uh, we uh, have been connected with South Orange for the last seven years. As mentioned, uh, our daughter, Jenna, who works at the library now as a graduate of Seton Hall University. So uh, we really uh, appreciate that your community has adopted her uh, as a part of your community and your family. And I appreciate that introduction. So again, yes, I uh, retired from the Air National Guard 106 Rescue Wing in 2013. I was um, a career airman and I'd like to just bring you through that journey a little bit to give you some uh, perspective of where I've been and where I've, gone, gone, where I've gone to and why I'm doing what I'm doing now. So I joined the military in February of 1989 and I share openly with people when I decided to join the military, uh, it, was, it was all about what I was looking for in my journey and I was looking for something to be a part of I didn't know at the time until I went to basic training that it would be a career for me. I was just inspired and transformed. And in February of 1989, the world was somewhat of a safe place. And two years into my military career, we were in Desert Storm. So every year uh, since my service time uh, in, in that period has always been a time of potential conflict. Of course, after 9-11, we went to, really went to work. And so 20 years now, we've been... Uh, setting up to be prepared to deploy and go and do uh, what we need to do uh, for our country. So anyway, so I joined in 1989. Um, I was full time with the Air National Guard. And I just, again, I wanted to do everything uh, that I could to support the unit and the airmen around us. I ran through the ranks very quickly. And by my 10 years of service, I had made the rank of first sergeant, uh, which is an E7 in the Air Force. So my, you know, my career was very blessed. Uh, yeah, I had one deployment in October of 2001 to Kuwait. I did not see combat and I share that with people because it is, it is a, a specific thing to our culture, uh, but we were always signed up and ready to go anywhere, anytime. I did a lot of what they call CONUS, which was continental US travel through my career. My family knows the sacrifice that that is to be away from home for long periods of time and have the family support around us to be able to you know, help them when mom was away. You know, I was the mom that picked them up at school in, in my combat uniform. And you know, it was something very different. You know, the, the, uh, the community didn't really, wasn't too aware of the military construct on Long Island because we don't have any active duty bases on Long Island. I uh, must say I, I born and raised on Long Island um, and my children were uh, born and raised as well. So, uh, you know, 
we had a different perspective coming from a community that didn't have a lot of military around, but I have to say that it's the community support that really makes it happen. Whether you serve or, you know, if you haven't served, but you know somebody that served, we are always grateful for the support that you lend, the community lends that want to help veterans. So that's where I started in the military. And as you said, I retired in, in 2013 and I didn't know where I was going to go next. So I decided to sign up and go to grad school. And I found a project. Well, actually, it found me. It was a startup from a non-for-profit called the Joseph P. Dwyer Veterans Peer Support Project. It was a new and innovative program uh, specifically for New York. Four counties in the state of New York had funding for it. And since then, it's grown in almost nine years to 26 counties in the state of New York that have funding for peer services. Uh, I got an opportunity to see it from the, you know, from, from the start and watch the program grow. And I can say in the eight and a half years that I've been serving in this capacity in the veteran space, we've uh, touched thousands of lives, thousands of lives, people that have um, struggled with uh, what we call reintegration issues. And I do wanna say that we do acknowledge that not every veteran that comes home uh, is struggling with, uh, with post-traumatic stress, you know, but there are a lot of um, th challenges when you return from service uh, and that's why we're here today to talk about some cultural awareness and some things that wrap around that. So, you know, culture in the military starts from the very first day of basic training. It, it really is, um, like I said, transformation for somebody because you come in to what I call the me to we concept. You come in as one, but you leave as a team. And that really is instilled in our culture from the first day. You know, you bring the people around you up together as a team you know that you have each other's back. I mean, that's not just a term that we use loosely. When you say to another service member, I have your back, they know that you, you're, you can be trusted with their life potentially. Um, so, you know, the, the military uh, is, is really immersed in, in cultural values. And again, I speak from the Air Force perspective, because that's, you know, that's where I came from. Uh, the Air Force has uh, uh, their core values and it's called, it's integrity first, service before self, and excellence in all we do. And that's not just a value that we speak, it's a value we live. And even to this day, raising a family, you know, we instill those values in our children, uh, those three core values, because it really is just uh, important to know that you have that foundation. Um, and, and in the military, culturally, you never leave someone behind, you never leave an airman behind, you never leave a buddy behind. And so working within the population that we serve right now, when you have a veteran that's out in the community that is struggling with reintegration issues such as um, homelessness, underemployment or you know, lack of employment, housing, these are all, these are all um, areas that our agency support in the veteran community. So you, know, you can have a veteran that comes back after a military service for six years, 20 years, and they have this resume of skill sets, but then you go into the community and you try to translate that into, you know, what does that mean, you know, as far as a career on the civilian side? That's that's a real challenge in, in our communities. And again, our agency has uh, community partners that work within those different areas of expertise. So we're not the, no, you know, we don't know everything about every type of situation, but we've built a relationship with the, with the community network to ensure that we can always do a handoff to someone. So for instance, if I've got somebody comes in and they can't, they, they can't you know, uh, put to paper what their skills were because they were a machine gunist, you know, gun uh, specialist or they were in transportation. And, and what does that mean in the civilian world? So we have experts that come and help them do resume building to help them translate what their military service because they do have, you know, coming from the military, if you make the rank of E5, let's say, that means that you were probably in charge of a unit or you know, or you had some leadership, you probably had a lot of leadership. The military, and again, particularly in the Air Force, really um, values highly uh, promoting, uh, promoting education and training and advancing your career. So you have all these skill sets that you take from the military and then you know, they, there's, you know, there's this perception, oh, I can be a cop or you know, I'm gonna you know, get, go, go into the fire department. Um, you know, there's so much, and I'm not saying that those aren't wonderful jobs. I mean, that, that's all service. And, and I think a lot of us are drawn to going into uh, a first resp responder position because we are service driven. 
So we work with them to help them kind of navigate the systems, help them connect with the VA services. Uh, just, uh, you know, just for statistics speaking, only one third of our service members that we know of that we've been working with are really accessing VA services. So what does that mean? Well, they are looking for services in the community. And so we connect them with, you know, through the peer program, we're able to connect them with, um, with other agencies that can help them navigate the systems in the community. Because it can be overwhelming, especially for a service member that's struggling that might have PTSD, which mm -hmm. post-traumatic stress is a signature wound of the modern day post 9-11 war. It's really changed um, the way when veterans come back, how, um, you know, how they need, you know, additional services to be able to, you know, regulate that. You know, our peer program is all community-based. We're all community-based peers. We're not clinicians. We don't try to be clinicians, although we do have some that are in social work, which is another good avenue to, you know, assist and navigate. But we do help them find, um, you know, their new identity and their new sense of purpose. So we speak a lot about identity and sense of purpose in the military and in the veterans uh, community, because when you are in the service, you're literally wearing your identity. When you put your uniform on, you've got your name, your rank, you've got your, your branch of service on, on your uniform case. So you're literally wearing your identity. And I can share from my transition out of military service after being in it for so many years, that the day I retired and I hung up my uniform, I didn't know who I was anymore. I wasn't Chief Lease anymore. I, I'm Marcel, you know, and, and who is that? And where, you know, where do I go and take all these competencies that I've learned in the military and translate them into serving the community in another way? And so working within the Dwyer Project and the peer-to-peer -peer services uh, in our county, it really did give me a new sense of purpose because we're still working with veterans. We're still helping families and and. You just, you're not wearing a uniform anymore and that's okay. Um, the peer program is, has really, it's an evidence-based practice now. We've had research done on peers, not just in the veteran community, but there's research all over the peer space. And it really does work knowing that somebody understands because they've had a lived experience and it really, it, it validates your uh, struggles if you are having struggles getting back into the community. So that, that really is where this program has launched in such a successful way. Uh, Marcel, can I ask, uh, sorry to interrupt, but I was just wondering, so the Dwyer project is separate from the VA, is that yes. right? Yes. Not connected. yes, that's a very good distinction. I, I'm glad you, you, uh, you, you asked that question because the Dwyer project is a community-based, not for, through a not-for-profit organization, not affiliated with the VA, but we do work with the VA. We do a lot of cross-referral so if we have somebody that comes into our peer-to-peer -peer and we know, we, one of the first things I always screen people for is, uh, are you accessing VA services? And if not, why? You know, there's a multitude of reasons. Uh, one thing to recognize is that if you come out of the military with other than an honorable discharge, that negates services to the VA and you don't have access to that kind of health care. Many people that we see through the program and in our communities may have come out with an other than honorable because of their PTSD. And so their service is the reason why they had some sort of blip in their careers and got other than honorably discharged. I know that Congress in, in our, you know, our federal government is, is lobbying and they have lobbied successfully to, um, to have a, what they call a service upgrade, a discharge service upgrade. So if somebody had PTSD and or a traumatic brain injury and we find that they were discharged because of that, we can, over, we can have them overturn the discharge to honorable so that they have access to services. So I know that a lot of people in our communities don't know that, so I'm glad I had the opportunity to share that with you. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, yeah, so that uh, VA is a, you know, and VA is a huge, you know, it's a, it's a huge system. There's so much going on. There's so many services there. And again, somebody that may not have the cognitive ability to navigate that, uh, the peer will be that person to work with them through uh, through those challenges. There's also community-based centers. In fact, and towards the end of this, I actually took a couple of notes on some of the local area um, resources, both through the VA and through some of the community programs that I'd like to share so that you have local resources. Uh, I have to say, unfortunately, uh, New Jersey does not have the Dwyer Project. I hope that they 
adopt the model at some point. I know Congress, again, one of our congressional leaders is lobbying for funding for a na national peer-to-peer -peer program. So look out for that. Uh, hopefully that's something that comes down the line and then there'll be uh, funding for services because it really is key to successful reintegration. Uh, I can share, we have a, a, you know, rolling back to the beginning of the wire project, we had a young Marine that lived out on the east end of Long Island that was really struggling. Um, he had a PTSD diagnosis and a traumatic brain injury and started seeing a clinician out in Sag Harbor. And this clinician who uh, was not a veteran didn't really understand, you know, the, that, that cultural aspect of what it was to be a clinician and serve somebody that, you know, had these challenges. So she actually reached out through Google and she found the Dwyer Project in Suffolk County and she called us and we partnered with her and we have an eight year relationship right now. Uh, we were able to, she was able to learn about cultural competencies. Uh, we were able to have another resource to hand off to somebody in the clinical space. And it's just been a really healthy relationship. And that's something that uh, Dr. Mitchell and I actually go on the road and do presentations on what we call, it's, it's the peer professional relationship because you need, you need both. You need the peer and the professional, you know, to stay within our scope of practice and know when somebody that we're working with is beyond our capacity so that we, um, you know, we reduce risk. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of, misconceptions veterans coming into uh you know into our community i like to let people know that pe you know veterans don't necessarily go and reach out for mental health services in fact the word mental is is something that is a barrier because we think we're strong resilient warriors so if i'm the person running into the firefight when i come back and i'm struggling how do i ask for help and you know we work with them to ha to come to break down those barriers and again that really goes to our modeling healthy behaviors to, you know, the, the veteran I was starting to speak of that was out on the East End, not only did he successfully go through his um, yeah, uh, clinical treatment, actually started going to, to the Dwyer peer programs. We had groups before the pandemic, we had groups all scattered around the county that were open, very similar to like an AA setting, you know, when you, uh, when the 12 step programs that in, and again, in non-clinical world, they would come in at any time you don't have to show your, your DD-214, which is your record of discharge. You don't have to prove that you're a veteran, which is another uh, very important difference between what we do in the community and the VA, because you have to have that honorable discharge to access services. So we welcome a veteran that comes into a group or into our program through an individual engagement. And, um, and this particular individual, not only did he su successfully navigate the systems, he became a peer. So now you have another Marine, let's say, that comes into the program, and now he's validated because he's saying, look, I struggled openly. I'm willing to share my story. You can be down this road, too. And there's always, you know, social support. Social support is so important, especially what we just went through the last year and a half with the pandemic. And, um, you know, how do you, how do you engage people in the community when the community shut down? Um, so, again, back to the cultural uh, competencies. Yeah, the word mental, like I said, has that negative connotation, although we try to leverage that going for help, you know, it's a sign of strength and not weakness. And it's something that happens over time when people are ready. Uh, so we have to go to where they are in their journey to bring them up to the next level. Um, veterans don't want to look like they're broken. And again, I don't want to send that message because many veterans, so many more of us come through it successfully and are, are thriving and surviving in the community. But again, the peer program and the other programs that we work with to service the community are, were born because there was so much struggle. And after 20 years of, uh, of sustained conflict we, and multiple tours and, you know, and now even more so with us pulling out of Af Afghanistan, you know, I know our, our phone was ringing off the hook. We were getting more and more calls the last month or so with people saying, why did we do it? You know, why I, I saw my buddy, you know, uh, struggle and, and, you know, what, what was it all for? So we're working with them to, again, you know, deliver healthy messages and, and work with them to find the, the services that they need. Um, before I go any further, um, if there's any questions right now or anything, if, if not, then I would like to put on a, a short video clip that so you don't have to hear me for the whole time. And uh, this is something from PsychArmor, which if anybody ever wants to learn more about cultural competencies, 
Psych Armor is a website and they have something called, it's a, it's a 101, Veteran 101 on Cultural Competencies. But this particular clip is something that we use in some of our training to convey the message. And it's called, it's 15 things veterans would like you to know. So uh, Laura, if it's okay, if I can share my screen. That's just fine, yeah. Please uh, we'll put that on and just let me know, Mike, make sure the audio is working and we'll just take a minute and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a few minutes. So, uh, but I'm sure you'll uh, really appreciate this, this video clip. So let's play that. Welcome to 15 Things Veterans Want You to Know. My name is Dr. Heidi Kraft. I'm a clinical psychologist and the clinical director at PsychRammer Institute. I am a Navy veteran. I spent nine years on active duty in the Navy and deployed to Iraq in 2004 with a Marine Corps surgical company. I'm very pleased to be here today to introduce a new way of thinking about military culture. America is a country made up of people from countless different cultural backgrounds. Certainly, it's part of what makes us great. For some time now, people have been trying to understand what it means to be culturally competent. The military is a culture, just like any other. Military people, like those from any culture, have certain beliefs, practice certain rituals and traditions, and hold fast to certain ideals that shape who they are as a group of people. In order to bridge the gap, between non-military Americans and those who wear the uniform of their country, military cultural competence is an important first step. So what are the most important parts of a culture to understand? Well, we went to the source. We asked our veterans. We asked thousands of American veterans, what is one thing you would want your doctor, nurse, therapist, employer, anyone in your life, really, who's trying to understand you, to know about you? This course is based on their top 15 answers. First and foremost, ask a very important question. Did you serve in the military? It matters, and it begins the conversation. You see, in the military, we have our own history and our own language. In fact, if you listen to military people talk, it's truly as if they're speaking a different language. We have very specific traditions, and they are richly written throughout history. They often tell you who we are. For instance, at a ball game, when the national anthem is played, you'll see military people standing at attention, even long after they've left active duty. We take pride in our sacrifices, and sometimes we feel like people who haven't lived our lives can't understand. So asking, did you serve in the military, is a great way to begin a conversation and to engage a veteran. As an active duty Marine said, we are not like you. The veteran and his family are tough, but have the biggest hearts and have gone through huge sacrifices and a broad spectrum of emotions many times. Knowing that, please start the conversation. Ask a person if he or she served. If the answer is yes, let's move on to the 15 things veterans want you to know. Number one, we are not all soldiers. This is a big one for military people, and if there is one thing to take away from this course, it would be this. While many people, including those in the media, talk about military personnel, they refer to soldiers as a general term. This is not correct. Soldiers are only in the Army. There are four other branches in the armed services, and they are very different. They have different missions and even different subcultures. Although we are all part of that same larger team, Military people are proud of their specific service branches. Very importantly, you do not need to know specifics about what the Coast Guard does, or what the ranking structure of the Air Force is, or what you call a person in the Navy. You don't need to know why the Marines mission is different from the Army's. But knowing that these five branches are different is the first and important step to military cultural awareness. So this leads us to an important follow-up question. If a person answers yes, he or she served, the next question should be, which branch? Asking this question demonstrates that you know the difference between the five branches. I guarantee this earns you instant credibility with that veteran, and it keeps the conversation going, which is the whole point. Number two, the reserves are part of the military. There are two ways to serve in uniform in our country. One is active duty, 
in which case your full-time job is putting on the uniform and fulfilling your role in the armed forces every day. The other way is the reserves. These are people who train and stay ready to be called up if they're needed. Members of the reserves who are seen in every branch train together one weekend a month and two weeks a year. When not in uniform, they go back to their civilian jobs in their communities. They will be called to help when our country needs them, either to augment a national defense-related mission or, sometimes in the case of the National Guard, to help in domestic, national, or local emergencies where additional support is required. When reservists are mobilized and deployed, they come home from their deployments and go right back to their civilian communities. But often they don't have the same support or resources as an active duty person does when they return. This can cause a significant amount of additional stress on military reservists and their families. Number three, not everyone in the military is infantry. When we think of the classic, generic version of the military person, we definitely think of infantry. This is an image probably fed through our culture from the time we're young. But the truth is, the range of what people do in the military is truly remarkable. We are expertly trained in literally hundreds of jobs, from mechanics, cooks, pilots, and sailors, to divers, administrators, doctors, musicians, to weapons specialists, military police, firefighters, and air traffic controllers. We operate, maintain, and fix all types of weapons, aircraft, sea vessels, vehicles, equipment, and machinery. Knowing this, the third important question to ask after learning a person served and in which branch would be, what did you do during your service? What was your job? This shows that you know there are many different things a military person could have been trained to do. It's an acknowledgement or a validation of that person's training and skills and how hard he or she has worked to be an expert at that job. It also demonstrates that you understand each individual job is vital to the overall execution of the military's mission. This will help you to consider the impact of different occupations might have, physically and mentally, in order to be sensitive to that in conversation. As one veteran explains, our bodies are pounded daily. By the time I hit retirement age, I will have lost several inches off my height due to daily stress. Number four, we have leaders at every level in the chain of command. Almost immediately out of basic or officer training, military people are responsible for those that work for and with them. And there's a sense of real leadership that's engendered, taught, and truly embraced all the way down to the lowest level of the chain of command and all the way up to the highest. Leadership is a very important factor in military service. Those who wear the uniform feel responsible for others and accountable to others. And this is a large part of the pride we take in our service. Number five we are always on duty. In the military, there are no days off, even when a person is on leave. We can be called back at a moment's notice if the unit is getting ready to deploy or in the case of an unexpected mission demand. So even when we're on vacation, we're not really on vacation. Here's a quote from a Coast Guardsman. I am always on call. I can never plan a vacation because an operation can come up at the last minute. Work schedules are pretty tough at times. Number six. We take pride in our appearance and in our conduct. Military people take appearance, conduct, and physical fitness very seriously. Even out of uniform, we're held to a standard with regard to how we look. Physical fitness matters in a real way. We need to train so that when we're called, we're ready to accomplish that mission. Likewise, we're responsible for maintaining a standard of conduct. In fact, active duty people are held to an actual code of military justice. It's a set of rules that governs military people and we can be charged with crimes based on these rules and held accountable in court. Some people have perceptions about military people that maybe they're rigid based on the way they look. In fact, we like to think of ourselves not as rigid, but as proud. Simply stated, this is just the way we've been brought up and we believe that these standards have a purpose. Number seven, we did not all kill someone and those who have do not want to talk about it. This one doesn't need a lot of commentary. Unfortunately, this is a question that gets asked of our military veterans far too often. I realize people are just curious, but I hope this course will educate you to realize that this is not a question any military veteran wants to be asked. Whether he or she has lived through this or hasn't, it's not a question that should be asked of military veterans. Please don't ask us that, ever. Number eight, we do not all have PTSD. There's a general perception that anyone who deployed to combat develops PTSD, and that's just not true. 
a vast majority of veterans, including combat veterans, do not go on to develop post-traumatic stress disorder. Some people might have symptoms in the acute aftermath of any kind of trauma, but then experience a natural recovery process. This is also true for combat. While combat can certainly be very traumatic, it can also lead to great moments of reward and friendship and love. Number nine, those of us who do have an invisible wound are not dangerous and we are not violent. Invisible wounds of war, including post-traumatic stress disorder, traumatic brain injury, depression, and substance use disorder, are not obvious to someone looking at a veteran, but they are real injuries, causing real suffering, and they deserve the same respect and treatment as physical injuries. The media has created a bias that insinuates those with PTSD might be violent. This is not true. Those of us with invisible wounds of war may be injured, but we are not violent. Number 10, it is really hard for us to ask for help. The military culture is based in service, sacrifice, and helping, or even rescuing others. It is others-based, and historically has not valued self-care or help-seeking behaviors. There's an expectation of mission accomplishment, even at personal cost. Because of this long-standing cultural bias, reaching out for help for ourselves is difficult for military people. Some veterans view asking for help as a sign of weakness. It also takes a great level of trust for a veteran to allow him or herself to be vulnerable. Please have patience and don't give up on us. Number 11, our military service changes us. That change is permanent and that's okay. We wouldn't expect anything else. Like I said, it's a culture with its own traditions, rituals, language, standards, expectations, stigma, wonderful moments and horrible moments. It's unreasonable to think that a person will go through those experiences and be unchanged. Number 12, we differ in how much we identify with the military after we leave active duty. As in any culture, some people find themselves truly defined by their service and their association with the military. Others consider it part of their past and move on from it. If I'm getting to know a veteran, I like to ask these questions. How has your military service shaped you? How does it factor into how you define yourself now? Again, there's instant credibility in those questions as it gives us a chance to see that you understand. We are all different, both while we serve and after we serve. Number 13, our families serve with us. Military families have some of the most challenging jobs in the world. They're subject to frequent separation from their loved ones and moving from place to place, sometimes every two or three years. It's difficult to establish schools for the kids or jobs for the spouses. Then the service member comes back from deployment and wants to take back some of those responsibilities that he or she used to have. And the spouse feels like, you know, I've really got this process down. I know what I'm doing now. All of this requires flexibility, bravery, strength, and resilience. Anyone who knows a military family knows that all those words define us. Number 14, we would die for each other and we would die for our country. We would and we do. It doesn't matter where we fight, the geographical location or the technologic or political backdrop. It doesn't matter what the mission is or who's in charge of the country. Why we fight has always been the same from the very beginning. It's about the people to our left and our right and any military person will tell you that. The people with whom we serve become brothers and sisters to us, and we would die for them, and we do, and we would not change that culture of sacrifice for the world. Number 15, we've all made this sacrifice for one reason, to serve something more important than ourselves. When it comes down to it, this defines our culture. People who choose to serve in uniform and who sign on that line, saying they will make that sacrifice, they live by a certain code. And we like to say it's honor and commitment and duty. Most of all, though, these are people who make a choice. We've all chosen to serve something larger than ourselves, more important than ourselves. That's a unique and special piece of military culture that runs through everything and everyone who's part of it. We are choosing the concept of service. In summary, asking the right questions gives you credibility and brings you closer to the veterans in your lives. It opens the door for a better understanding of our experiences and our military culture. When you meet someone you think might be a veteran, ask, did you serve in the military? Which branch? What job did you do in the military? The military is a complicated culture and you do not have to know a lot of details about the military in order to show some military cultural awareness to bridge that gap between yourself and the veterans in your life. We hope this course has taught you a few important things that veterans want you to know.
Okay. Wow. Is back on? Okay. So um, I, you, I'm so impacted by that video uh, every time I hear it because I've also, I learned things because my experience is different than somebody else's experience. And numbers 11 and 12 are the ones that really resonate with me about how the military changes you and that's okay. Because I am the person I am today because of my service in the military. You know, I, I, I have, um, you know, my own cultural awareness of, of, the, of, you know, of veterans, but I learn from others, you know, other branches of service. Like she also mentioned that, you know, we're not all soldiers, you know, we're sailors, airmen, Marines, Coast Guard, and, uh, and, and it's okay not to know the difference, but if you have those questions uh, in, in queue, when you come across somebody that had served, and, and that I think was one of the most important things that I, I've learned through my years is that, uh, you know, when you, when you come across somebody you think has been in the military, if you ask them they've, if they've served rather than be, are you a veteran, you make, you, you're probably gonna, you might get a different answer um, because there are many reasons why someone that has served might not embrace their veteran identity uh, statistically, women uh, don't embrace the identity as much as our male counterparts. Uh, you have, may have served, but you weren't in combat, so you don't think that you were a veteran, but you are. Or, uh, you know, or somebody that has an honor, other than honorable discharge may not want to mention that they served in the military. So that's, that's, that's a key, I think for me, was a key takeaway. Um, I, before I go on any further, I just want to, Laura, if you have any questions or anybody has any comments about uh, what we just saw, I really appreciate it. Does anybody have questions for Marcel? I, I mean, I have one, but I was going to see if anybody else, <laughs> anybody, you can pipe up now. Francis, I think Fran, Fran does, but she's muted. Oh, oh she's muted. Oh, can you unmute yourself? Okay. Uh, maybe Michael can, can help out with that. <laughs> mute. Am I unmuted? Oh, you're you're good, unmuted. Friend. Great. Yeah. Well, I must say that I, I am just overwhelmed and very happy to, to see all of this because to me, you know, it, it reminds me a little bit of being a teacher, you know? You have another culture there too. And, um, and people don't understand us as teachers when we come out of it or in it, it's, it's a whole different thing. So what you showed us today was wonderful, unbelievable. And uh, for me, it was so excellent. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Oh, I really do. I'd like to see that over and over again until it's really in my head. You know, it's amazing. Uh, I had a brother who was in the Second World War, and I was a little girl when he was in, and I never heard him talk about it. But he was, he was wounded. He carried shrapnel. I mean, the whole thing. And everything was like quiet. But it shouldn't have been. We should have known more about them. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Fran, thank you so much for sharing that. And uh, yeah, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned um, about your brother because I mean, yeah, the World War II veterans, the greatest generation. You know, you've got your Korean War veterans, the the Forgotten War, the Vietnam veterans that came home and were spat on and not accepted. In, in our communities for the most part, which was a, a horrible time in our, in our history. And, you know, and then you have this quote unquote peace time, which was post, pre, post Vietnam pre desert storm, which wasn't peaceful. There were many, many conflicts around the world during that time, but the, the VA calls it peace time, but there was a lot of trauma ensued and a lot of the veterans that we've worked with in our community have come from that era. And then, you know, we've got your post 9-11, the modern day OIF, OEF, OND, which is I always got to remember acronyms are very, very big in our culture too. So OIF is Operation Enduring Freedom, OIF Operation Iraqi Freedom, and OND Operation New Dawn. Those are uh, the, the major conflicts that we've had in a post 9-11 world. You know, I, I always have to remember that, you know, my daughter who's here with us today was only five years old on fifth day of kindergarten on 9-11. So when she graduated from high school and so many, you know, that generation, I, I, I kind of took a moment and I thought to myself, this generation, my kids age and, and young, they only know a post 9-11 world. And so, you know, I just thought that that was such a perspective to have. Uh, but the differences between the era and branches of service in the veteran community are so vast. 
but yet there's so many similarities. We had a group one time with a Vietnam veteran that was leading it with a post 9-11 veteran. And, you know, you think about how different their, the time was that they served, you know, you, you had a very unpopular war uh, with a non-volunteer force versus, and still war is not popular, but, you know, this was a volunteer, uh, you know, service, service time the last, you know, 20 some years, uh, 50 something <coughs> since Vietnam. So different perspectives come in the room when, you're, when you meet different generations of veterans, but they, but they do bond. They do bond and they do come together because of that cultural competency that we've been talking about from day one and understanding about having, you know, having somebody these back. So, anyway, Laura, you had a question or anybody else? Oh, yeah, okay. anybody else? Agnes? I'd like to something. Okay. Oh, Phyllis. Yeah, hi. I just wanted to say, now I know why your daughter was so proud of you. you you're amazing. Um, and it was such an impressive talk. It, I really was fascinating, Marcel. I thank you <laughs> for that. And I just have one question um, because I would just like to know if you've gotten feedback from the, pe from the soldiers who have come back from Afghanistan, what would you say the majority feel that President Biden did the right thing or that they should have stayed there? Is there a majority or would you just say it's um, it's, it's too new to talk about or to analyze. I, I would, and Phyllis, again, thank you for inviting me uh, to to um, be a part of this uh, conversation today. I really do appreciate the opportunity. You were and, fascinating. You were fascinating. Well, you. Look, I, I want to say right now, and I can only speak from my little corner of the world right now, is that it's still very mixed. And uh, but there was a there is a lot of anger with people that like I said earlier. We've had a lot of people calling because they're triggered. Uh, by the emotional response of us pulling out of, of Af Af Afghanistan. And, and uh, so, yeah, there's, there's a lot. I mean, I have images in my head. I have my own perception. I can't stop thinking about that, um, that, that aircraft, uh, the C-17 that you saw. So, I mean, on every news channel of uh, the aircraft leaving Afghanistan and civilians on the ground trying to get on. Right. That, that air crew, I, I get chills. They had to make the decision to go wheels up with people's lives at stake in front of them to, to complete the mission. And that's just, that, that was very triggering for me that, you know, lives mm -hmm. had to be lost because of that. Um, so it's, it's a very emotional period right now. And I think that as we move <coughs> forward, you know, in our nation and as a community, we're going to, we're going to see more of an impact. Uh, but again, having, having talks like this, having communities open to learn about resources, that's, that's why we're here today, is to be able to share those resources, you know, and it kind of all circles back to that peer understanding of what it is to have served. So I hope that answers your question a little bit. You did, thank you. Thank you. And this goes back to what Fran was saying about, ah, uh, no, I forget, her dad or granddad who was, who served in World War II. Oh, brother. Um, and how like no one, talked about it talked about his service and I do feel like at, at least now the culture has changed enough that we do talk about like we have PTSD just the term that almost everyone knows right that there has been at least some progress I guess um, in accepting that and trying to understand what veterans have gone through yeah, absolutely you know again going, going back to what I've learned in my military career and, and having the, um, the honor of meeting World War II veterans uh, as few and far between as they are um, and understanding in that generation how they took their uniforms off and they just went back into the workforce. And, you know, the government had programs, they had the GI Bill, you know, uh, to, to, you know, to be able to get veterans to go and, and come back into the workforce, which is still very prevalent today. In fact, I find that when we started the peer program, uh, one of our, you know, one of our, one of our challenges and opportunities were is to find where do, where do veterans congregate, where do people that have served congregate, and we found statistically that so many of them, the younger generation especially, are taking advantage of the post 9/11 GI Bill, where they're getting pretty much 100% tuition paid for uh, by uh, by our, you know, by our government, so that, that they can repurpose themselves. And so we would we would go into the college communities. Uh, I want to say again, I can speak for Long Island. Uh, but I'm sure, again, across the country, there, there's, a, well, there's a Student Veterans Association of America. So SVA 
as they call themselves, Student Veterans of America, uh, they have an actual mission to, to be able to integrate veterans coming back and going to school because you know now you have a, a population that you've identified. Because again, if they don't register with the VA when they come back, we don't know that they're out there. Now, mm -hmm. Long Island in the region, in Suffolk County, New York, um, we have the largest population of veterans in the state. And Nassau, Suffolk County, which if you know Long Island as a region, we're second largest in, in the veteran population next to San Diego. And, and that's, that's, a that's a tremendous amount of work that we have to do. Uh, but we use the fraternal organizations like the American Legion, the VFWs, and to connect and, and provide services and offer opportunities. So again, we're so rich with you know, veteran, civilian alike, the community comes together and really wants to be able to you know, identify what's, what, you know, what the challenges are, what are the opportunities, and, and how, do we, you know, how do we do handoffs to that next step? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, just, I know we, we're, we've only got a few more minutes. Um, yeah, we have a few more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just I know. I, and I thought we were gonna ha I have so much time left over. <laughs> <laughs> it goes fast. Um, I, I guess I can just mention a couple, couple of notes I have here. The, the, I, I always like to attribute the male versus the female perspective. Again, having been a woman that served in the military and having been a woman that attain the senior rank on the enlisted side. Um, you know, I, I remember coming into the service thinking, all right, you know, I'm the, I'm the minority, you know, and, and I didn't, when I looked up through the chain of command as I went through the military, I didn't see too many people that looked like me coming through the ranks, but that has definitely changed. You know, just like it's changed that, you know, there's, there's no combat operations uh, restriction for females to, to serve anymore. Uh, but that, that also means that the um, the cohort of, the, of, of veterans, the female veterans that are coming back is increasing in, in, in tr dramatic numbers. There are more women veterans that have served in combat today than ever before in our history. But yet we don't have, again, so many of us don't embrace the identity. Um, you know, they just, it's, it's a challenge. It's a challenge. And again, maybe the female perspective, there's a lot of research behind why women veterans don't embrace the identity and don't go for resources. Or you know maybe they just don't see them, but that that that's a that's a definitive difference. Um, and that's not to say that our male counterparts aren't feeling that same you know struggle. But they're you know having been um, a woman who served in the military, there were definitely some challenges going through it. Uh, you know having to be a mother, having to leave my family. You know uh, I didn't mention it earlier. My husband of 29 years as of this week, uh, he he and I met in the military, and that <sighs> before I did, he he had to be. The guy taking care of small kids when I was away, and and you know it wasn't always very easy, you know. And there's something, and they mentioned it in the video also about the, the defined roles. I, you know, if I was the I was the primary you know caregiver in our in our traditional family um, relationship. So when I went away and he took over that, and then I came back, it's like okay, I'll take my job over. It's like wait a minute, I, I got this now. I know how to do this. So, you know, a lot, a lot of different transitions when you come back in, you know, from, from being away. And that also, the family perspective, you know, my kids grew up in a military family, so they, they don't know anything other. Uh, but when the family, you know, when the military member serves, the family serves. There's a lot of sacrifice on the family side. Um, and coming back is, again, sometimes a challenge uh, to reintegrate to, to those traditional roles. Mm. I just want to leave you with one more thing and leave room for questions. Yeah, I, I mentioned earlier about the impact of COVID. We really face, I mean, our, our, our world, our country, our world uh, has so many challenges with reaching out to community. And we did see, we are seeing, and there's a lot of research around that right now about the uptick in what the social isolation did to, to veterans specifically uh, with an increase of, of um, alcohol use or substance use. Uh, increases in suicide. Veterans are, uh, they, they, they always put a number at 22 a day. We know that that's more. And we always say one is one too many. Um, you know, that's, they're a vulnerable population. Those are struggling. So the, the impact of COVID, we're going to see a lot coming out of that. But again, the services are out there. Things are opening up and we are working hard to, to continue engaging those veterans. Um, and the last thing I want to mention is I mentioned about the local community. I did a little research last night so I could be spun up on this. New Jersey has more than 400,000 veterans. Um, so your veteran population here in New Jersey formed nearly 5% of, of the total population in the state, according to the Veterans Bureau. And they rank 19th in the country as total number in veterans. So you're 19 in, in, in the veteran population here. 
And yeah. as of 2019, Essex County has almost 20,000 veterans. So just right here in your community. So then, and that's according to the VA data that I looked up yesterday. So you got a lot of veterans here and yes. yeah. But you also have fraternal organizations, like I mentioned, um, local resources. Your community right over here in East Orange has one of the largest VA medical centers and they have a lot of very yeah. specialized. We've sent veterans from Long Island to VA here for specialized care. So you've got East Orange right here, the medical center. You have VA community clinics in Morristown and Jersey City, which are your neighboring areas. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I did find the Vet to Vet program. That's not the Dwyer program, but it's called New Jersey Vet to Vet program. Mm -hmm. And Soldier On is another organization that works with veterans in the community. So you can just Google search veterans in New Jersey, and you're going to find a ton of resources out there that if somebody comes into your library system or in your community that you need, you can at least know where to maybe do a handoff. So anyway, that's all I have. I really want to have another time for questions or any comments or anything or anything you want to ask Laura specifically, or something I missed. Any any quick questions or, or comments from Marcel before we go? I don't, have, I don't have a question, but I just want to, uh, my, my uncle Walter was shot down over Normandy I didn't know him because I was a baby at the time, <clears throat> but I did finally get to go to Normandy and he's buried in the, the uh, American cemetery there. So um, I got to see that. And then my brother was in the Air Force Academy <clears throat> as an enlisted man, because he was smart. <laughs> and, um, but when he was 24, he was in an accident. He ended up being in the, uh, East Orange Veterans Hospital. And uh, after four years in the coma, he passed away. And he's buried in the um, Long Island National Cemetery. So two people in the Air Force. Clara, thank you. Thank you for sharing your family story. Yeah, everybody knows, everybody has a family member. Everybody knows a veteran or someone that served in the military. And it's just such a, it's a personal story for each one of us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, Marcel. This yes. has been wonderful and eye-opening and really, really incredible to hear you talk about veteran cultural awareness and really, I think, educated a lot of us today. So thank you so much for being with us. Um, we really appreciate it. We really appreciate it. Coming, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> Does the child of a military service family want to say anything? <laughs> yes, please. Yeah, I mean, it was just like we said, a lot of what you talked about, it's normal to me. Um, <laughs> Mom went, you know, to another state for, you know, a weekend. Sure. Dad's in charge. We get takeout. Like, that's, <laughs> <laughs> that was normal for me for life. Um, going to the base for drill weekends and, and family events at the base. I, you know, spent my childhood getting tours of aircrafts and helicopters and, you know, doing mock deployments they'd give us. So all of this was very normal for me. And I met a lot of kids that, you know, had the same experiences. So when people talk to me and say, wow, that, you know, must been hard it must have had been such a whole different experience and I'm like well it wasn't it was my life you know we served with my mom right it's interesting too that you ended up working in service like to the community obviously not military service but I still feel like you know working in the library is a form of very important community service so I wonder if that like your your childhood influenced it could have. I mean, at this point, I can't see myself anywhere else. Um, so thank you to South Orange for embracing me. As well, a thank you for member. being with <laughs> Yeah. I love yeah. seeing everyone every day at the library. Um, it was kind of an accident that I ended up here, but it was such a grateful accident, you know, just coming from Seton Hall and looking for a job still in the community and now officially here full time. So I'm really happy to be here. Great. We're so Great. glad you're here. And then bring mom in here too. I know. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, Thank you again, Marcel, for the wonderful program. Thank you so much, Laura. Thank and you. the entire community. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Thank thanks you everybody for joining in, Bye, everyone. everyone.